Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget those benefits, like senior benefits. <laughs> Well, your, your senior pastor is also a senior. <laughs> he is. So you got two senior pastors. That's hilarious. Two seniors. Oh, my God. Y'all put a smile on my heart back, too. That's good. You can hear that close to my mind. Y'all sing happy birthday. That's a blessing. We are in Daniel 6. We got started last week. We're going to finish today. We're going to That's our plan. Um, I don't know if you remember or not, but I, I borrowed someone else's outline um, that I saw just to kind of walk through this. Um, he alliterates it, and it's five steps. As we walk through Daniel 6, the first step was the position of Daniel. And we talked about that last week. He was put in a great position there by King Darius um, over, over the, the kingdom there as, as Darius was, was now in charge. This is not Nebuchadnezzar. This is years later. This is near the end of the life of, of uh, Daniel. So remember that, that he's, he's high in position. And there's others that are in a similar position, but they begin to get jealous of Daniel because he did so well by the power of God that he was given even more authority. And so the second step that we saw um, last week was the plot against Daniel, the plot against them. These um, evil, no good doers, I should say, is um, they, they wanted to, to bring Daniel down. And so they hatched this plan to do that. Of course, they looked at his life and they couldn't find any reason, anything to bring him down. They tried to dig the dirt on Daniel and couldn't find anything. And so that's when they decided, you know, we're going to do something about that. And so they came up with this plan. And that's where we are now. And verse 6 is where we'll start. Yes, sir. Oh, I, I saw. Was thinking, I, was, I, was, I was thinking about uh, when we call the Jews, when we call the Jews, they were saying that they were blameless. Yeah. Because they didn't have any Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 20, I believe, you'll see that he is listed with Noah, and Noah Daniel, and Job as being people who will be saved because of their righteousness. Because of their righteousness. Yeah. And that um, you were talking about chapter 7 starting being the beginning of prophecy. I see in chapter 6 prophecy, future prophecy. Of, of the coming of Christ? Oh, yes, yes, of the Messiah. That's right. I see Daniel in chapter 6 pointing to Jesus. Very picturesque of Jesus which we're going to talk about here again. That is exactly I know. That's, right. that's, 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 that's all the scripture points to Christ. And this is, this is a, we'll see that at the end of this. Even this chapter points to Jesus. But a question that was asked, or I heard asked, it was, Daniel was blameless, right? Okay, which we can sinless. define. Sure. Was he sinless? It been we sin. know that. Yeah, it could have been sinless. But, so where's, but where's, his, where's his sin? Where, what, what did he sin at? Well, he, I don't know that's listed. That's why he's blaming us. You couldn't blame him. <laughs> but we know that all of sin and fallen short. Of all of sin. So, but in the context of Scripture, we know that he sinned. But in his actions, and even David, David sinned greatly, right? And yet, when he was confronted by Nathan, by, by Nathan um, about his sin with Bathsheba, and they said, you are that man. You know that story. David repented and confessed. And the Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. And so, um, just because someone is righteous and, and blameless doesn't mean they don't have sin, they do. But it's the righteousness of God. It's kind of like what we talked about Sunday um, in John 8, 12 and in Matthew, that Christ is the light of the world, and we're to be the light of the world. He calls us the light of the world. Well, it's His light, isn't it? It's not ours. It's His light through us. Um, and one example is the, the moon and the sun, and radiating the light, light of Christ, except for really, there's a difference here. Christ is in us. His spirit is in us. And so his, it's his light that's radiating through us in that. So Daniel didn't, it's a, he's a precursor in a sense, or a, a picture pointing to the gospel of Christ, which we'll see too. And since you mentioned that, I heard a preacher talking about the light of the world and the light yeah. of Jesus. His name's Ron Fowler. <laughs> and Daniel was a light yes. in Babylon and Medo-Persia. Oh, no doubt. He, was, he, he, he served God the best he could. So he was God's light, my God's man, right where God had planted. God puts light where there's darkness. Yep. And he put you where you are for a purpose. It's to leverage the, your, your life and your situation for the gospel, for his glory, for the glory of Christ. Um, let's jump right on in here then. And we're going to see what happened here with Daniel and these, these satraps and these administrators who were hatched this plan. Y'all, I'm, I'm read this as if, as if, if you've never heard it. <laughs> and I know you've heard it, but I hope you'll hear it afresh and hear it anew um, as we walk through this. 
And I hope anytime you come to the word of the Lord, even if it's the most familiar passage that you've ever been through, that God does something new in your life as you read his word because his word is the living word and he desires for you to know him even greater. And you're at a different place in your life than you were the first time you heard this. So I hope the Lord blesses you today as we, as we walk through Daniel 6. Um, verse 6. So the administrators and the satraps went together to the king and they said to him, Make King Darius live forever. And then notice what they said. All the administrators of the kingdom, prefects, the satraps, the advisors, and the governors, all of them have agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an edict that for 30 days anyone who petitions any god or man except for you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den. Was it really all the satraps that did that? It may have been. may not have been. But that's what they were saying. It's almost like a, a, a teenager. You know, Mom, can I go do this? And <laughs> No, you can't do it. Well, all my friends are doing it. Everybody's doing it. It may have been like that. But in any case, it appealed to something within Darius that all of them came with this plan. We all think that you, for 30 days, that you should make an edict. That anybody that petition someone else other than God, than you or, or, or the gods, they should, um, other, any man except for you or any God except for you, they will be thrown into the lion's den. Let me say it like that. Um, and this was appealing to something in his, I believe in his vanity. Verse eight says, therefore your majesty, your majesty establish the edict and sign the document so that as a law of the Medes and Persians, it is irrevocable cannot be changed and that was a law of the Persians they couldn't they couldn't go back and undo it the king couldn't even go back and undo it at that point if he made an edict and he couldn't come back the next day and say well I changed my mind you know we're not we're, we're familiar with flip-flopping in our politics a lot unfortunately but for them the king could not go back and just simply undo it because he changed his mind I've heard I think it's a line in in the movie maybe Moses I don't know where the guys or some movie says, so let it be written, so let it be done. Oh, yeah. And the Ten Commandments. Yul Brenner. I remember that. I imitate that. Let it be written. Let it be done. I say that to my wife on a lot of decisions that I make. <laughs> Is that before or after you get out of the hospital? <laughs> she does exactly that, Joe. <laughs> I do have the same hairline, so it kind of goes good with, with Yul Brenner there. <laughs> um, and then, so look what King Darius did. Verse 9. So King Darius signed the written edict. It is done. They're saying, Darius, we agree that you should be God. That's really what they're saying. For 30 days. We're not asking you. We're not saying, Lord. I mean, I'm Lord. We're not. Well, in a sense, that's what they were saying. We're not saying, Darius, that we should do away with all gods. And, you know, men aren't important. And people aren't important. What we're saying is for 30 days only, just a little short term, you should be considered as the one true source of everything that everyone needs. And they shouldn't even petition a man. They shouldn't petition another God except for you just for 30 days now they knew why they were asking this didn't they they didn't they didn't reveal all the information to Darius but they knew and they appealed to his vanity I believe and he sure did it and they, he, they even put the judgment in there you know and if anybody does worship somebody else or appeal to somebody else um, to with a request then they need to go into the lion's den what's the purpose of a lion's den there's one purpose death. It's, a, it's, it's execution. It's a death penalty. That's what they're saying. Anybody does this should be executed. They're, they didn't want to see Daniel demoted. They want to see Daniel dead. And that's, that's what their goal was. And their plan worked. Not to see Daniel dead, not the whole plan, but to put this edict in place because the king surely did it. Um, one commentator said, vanity is a vice that will make you act like a fool. And Darius played the fool. And that's still true today. In politics, um, not just government and politics. Y'all, there's politics all over. <laughs> and unfortunately, flattery greases a lot of wheels to turn that should never be turned. And, um, and this worked there, and the trap was set. So let's look at Daniel's response. Uh, one of the truths that we're going to see in this is that there are times and ways to exercise civil disobedience. There's times and ways to exercise civil disobedience. Because like Peter said in Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than man. And it came to the point where Daniel had a decision to make. Am I going to obey God? Or am I going to obey man? And, that's, and, he, and he does this right here. And, and so the third step, um, as we walk through this, the third, foot, the 
third footstep is the prayer of Daniel, verse 10 and 11. Verse 10 says, when Daniel learned that the document had been signed, this edict had been signed, he went into his house. The windows in his upstairs room opened toward Jerusalem. That's a great place to pray, to pray when you're in Babylon, isn't it? He can see towards Jerusalem, towards the temple in Jerusalem. And three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed and he gave thanks to his God just as he had done before. That's key. When he found out the news about the edict, he went and simply did what he had been doing all along. He continued to do this. Verse 11, then these men went as a group and they found Daniel petitioning and imploring his God. Imagine that. You had in your um, study guide the question, the second question there, once Darius signed the decree outlawing, petitioning any God or man except for the king himself, how did he respond? And why do you think he responded in this way? Somebody share with us. What are your thoughts on that? How did Daniel respond? And why did he respond that way? Yeah, he did. That's what he did. I'm going to go pray. Why do you think he responded in that way? Rather than going to Darius to pray. It's his faith. I mean, that's, that's, he trusted God. Mm -hmm. But it was law. He trusted God, but the law said this. Yeah, God tells us one day we might have to take the mark of the beast. We might, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about this the other day. We have laws that say, well, God's law says thou shalt not kill. Commandment. But we have laws on the books that say, well, what if we had a law on the book that says, okay, you criminals, you can either commit a murder or not commit a murder. Now, that's kind of strange to say that. But in a sense, we have people today that take stance as well. You can, ha you you should have the right to have an abortion, or not have an abortion. Is that even a real choice? Right. They talk about being having a choice to kill something. That's that's a good example. Yeah. I mean, just because it's law, don't mean it's that it's God's law. No, that's God right. We have man's earthly law, and we have God's laws, and the, even the morality is very different. Oh. We always have to put priority over God, with God's law. Man's law is always secondary to God's law. Man's law never changes God's law. It never changes God's law. Because man says something is right, and God says it's wrong, that means, well, now it's right. You've heard the, the phrase, I'm sure, might makes right. And for man, a lot of times it seems like, well, might means the votes, the number of votes. If we vote this in, then now it's okay. It may be legal, but it's still immoral. It's still against God's will. And so when, for Daniel to break this law that was put forth by the government, the one-man government, Darius, he broke this law immediately. But he was continuing to do his practice of his faith, and he, it, was, it was not new to him. He's not like, well, I've never prayed before, but because he made this law, I'm going to go pray just to break it. It wasn't that way at all. He continued to do as he had been doing because he loved God. And God's law was greater than him. His character, his character was not forged in this moment. His character was forged in his consistency all his life up to this moment. Same for you and me. You know, we may think, well, I'll make a big stand here and I'll really, you know, radiate that I'm a, I'm a great person. Um, and it may not be that vain as I just said it. But I would say our our. Our pattern in our lives, our consistency in our walk with Christ day in and day out, that's where our, our, our character is molded. So that we are prepared when these times come. You remember all the way back at Daniel 1 at the very beginning, verse 8, when it said Daniel, he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's food. That was at the beginning of these decades of being in Babylon. And, and that lifestyle of not defiling himself meant he wanted to honor God more than himself and more than man. And he had done that all through his life. And here near the end of his life, he's an older man now. He's presented with this opportunity or temptation. Satan likes to call temptations opportunities, doesn't he? <laughs> Not every open door is from the Lord. I'll go ahead and tell you that. Because sin is an open door. Not every open door is, is from the Lord. Here's an open door for Daniel. And yet he doesn't walk through that door of just walking through and, and, and praying to the king or acknowledging the king in that way. 
he continues to acknowledge his God because that's his life and that and God is greater than his own life. He values the Lord more than he values his own life. I don't know what he prayed. Wouldn't you like to have uh, an audio recording of what he prayed? Of course, we couldn't understand it because he didn't speak it in English. I can tell you that. But a translation of what he prayed. Some, one commentator said it may have been, you know, it could very well have been something along the lines of Psalm 57. In fact, in the, in the interest of time, I'm just going to read a couple of verses, but make a note, Psalm 57, and go back and, and read that psalm this afternoon sometime or sometime before we meet next week. What an incredible psalm. And this is about another person who faced persecution. David, when he said in Psalm 57, he said, Be gracious to me, God be gracious to me, for I take refuge in you. I will seek refuge in the shadow of your wings until danger passes. I call to the, the God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. And I'll stop there. Um, there's, the verse goes through verse 11. And I'll, let me read verse 11. God, be exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the whole earth. Oh, my gracious. What a perspective changer. When we get out of our, our, our world that's this big and understand the God who's this big. And so Daniel and his God had, had a time together there in his window as he normally did where the others who, had, who wanted him gone they knew he would be. <laughs> and there they saw him. And they, they um, said, yep, we got him now. Question for me is, what do you do when you're in danger? What do you, nobody here has um, ever been in a lion's den, right? Have you ever been in a figurative lion's den of one kind or another, though? Yeah, I bet. Um, what do you do when, when you're in danger? Not necessarily physical danger, but maybe your well-being is in danger or your pride is in danger, and I, um, <laughs> which should be. Um, our pride is in danger every time we encounter the living, encounter the living God, it should be. But um, even, even in our well-being or our, our, our sense of good health is in danger, that happens a lot. Yeah. Our, our, our normal life when, you know, things are going well and all of a sudden someone... Is sick or dies. What do you do? God is still our help. And if you have a pattern in your life of going to the Lord and praying with the Lord and trusting with the Lord with everything, day in and day out, you know His mercies that are in you every day. And if you have that pattern in your life and have that relationship with the Lord, I bet I can guess what you would do. You would do the same thing that you've been doing. You would trust in the Lord that day as you did the day before. Before the road took a turn. Because you know who's the God of the road. And who allowed that to happen. Let's look at the next step. The prosecution of Daniel. The prosecution of Daniel. This is step four. Verse 12. So they approached the king and asked about his edict. King. Now this is the satraps and the administrators. Hey king. Didn't you sign an edict, <laughs> feigning ignorance, didn't you sign an edict that for 30 days any person who petition, petitions any god or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den? Can you refresh our memory on that? It seems like there was something that happened about that. The king answered, as the law of the Medes and Persians, the order stands and is irrevocable. Then the king replied to, I mean, excuse me, then they replied to the king, hmm, Daniel one of the Judean exiles, <laughs> as if Darius didn't know who Daniel was, and they didn't even identify him as one of the administrators or the chief administrator, said, Daniel, one of the Judea, Judean um, exiles, he's ignored you, the king, and the edict that you signed, for he prays three times a day. As soon as the king heard this, he was very displeased. He set his mind on rescuing Daniel. He knew very well who Daniel was. He set his mind on rescuing Daniel and made every effort until sundown to deliver him. But he couldn't just simply with the stroke of a pen undo the edict. That was not allowed. Verse 15 says, And these men went together to the king and said to him, You know, your majesty, that it is a law that the Medes and Persians, um, of the Medes and Persians that no edict or, or ordinance the king establishes can be changed. So the king 
gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, this right here, he said, May your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. Do you think Daniel knew about the king? I mean, the king knew about Daniel's testimony of his life with the Lord. It's clear as a bell here that he knew. Daniel's light, the light of God was shining through Daniel in his life because day in and day out, he leveraged his life for the glory of God. Even in Babylon. Even in Babylon. And verse 17, um, a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet ring and was with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing in regard to Daniel could be changed. Interesting words by the king. May the Lord, excuse me, may your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. Where did Daniel's hope lie? Was it in the king? Of course not. But where did his hope lie? It was in God's sovereignty. His hope rested in the sovereignty of God. The Bible doesn't tell us about Daniel's response as he's on the way to the pit. It doesn't give us a description, a detailed description of what he may have said when he was in the pit. It doesn't tell us about what happened when he was in the pit in great detail. It tells us something really important that happened in there. Um, but it does tell us enough to, that we know that Daniel's hope was not in the king. It was in the sovereignty of the Lord. What do you think he was doing? Think he was praying? No doubt. No doubt. I know he's trusting God. You're right. He could have very well been praying. He <laughs> pray. <laughs> Boy, close our mouths, close our mouths, close our mouths. Yeah. But you know, when Jesus was on the cross, he prayed for those who crucified him. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Daniel may have very well prayed so the king could hear. Forgive this king. He doesn't know what he's doing. I don't know for sure, but you're right. He, he might very likely was praying. I can't imagine he prayed just those during that window of time. Well, it's whoop, 10, 15, got to quit praying. You know, what? I, I, I can't see that. Yeah. That's right. That's the question, how big is my God? And I'm really asking myself that, how big is my God? Do I have faith in a God that's big enough that he could close the mouths of life? Daniel knew about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walking in the fire many years earlier. Daniel knew about God all through, from the creation all the way through the history of, of um, you know, God and his people. He knew about all that. Well, you know, and that's one thing. There's some things we do just out of reaction, aren't there? And some, if, <laughs> I was walking in just a few minutes ago, and Francis and Susan were walking down. They were coming in, and I was walking up. Then they didn't see me. I was happened just to be out, coming out of the foyer. And the thought crossed my mind. I ought to go up behind them and go, boom. <laughs> but then I had better thoughts. <laughs> Don't do that. But had I done that, they likely would have reacted like you and I would have if somebody startled us like that. We didn't see them coming and just jumped out. Um, that, that's, a, that's a reaction to the circumstance around us. And y'all, we're human. We can, we can react to things around us. So we're not talking about a reaction, but we are talking about a response here. Daniel, may, you know, once, once he was brought before the king, doesn't mean, it, doesn't mean that immediately he, he had no emotion whatsoever. He may have. And we don't know if it was this much or this much. But what we do know is that how he responded, he went and he prayed, and then he was carried out to the to the lion's den. He was he was on his way to the lion's den, and the king encouraged him personally, "May your God rescue you." I just have two thoughts. 
um, looking at Darius's response, you know who really got played here was Darius. And I am sure, I, I mean, I can't help but believe he was furious. They set him up. Yes. And he fell for it. And so I can see him saying, oh, Daniel, I hope your God wins in this one, you know? Yeah. Um, and the second That's thing, true. you know, lions are smart in a, Jesus is the Lion of Judah. All God had to do was say lions. It's okay. That's awesome. Yeah, you that's know? right. I mean, the animals are pretty attuned. Yes. <laughs> that's great. Thank you for that. That is good. That is good. And he did get played. You're exactly right. Oh, he right. got played morally. I'm sure he was furious. Hey, you know, I don't know what you would have done. If I was Darius, I might have, when I realized I was played, you know what? All of y'all going in the last game. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's not, okay, you're the president. That's right. Sure, you have cabinet members and you know, the vice president and sure. all that kind of stuff. And you just want to sit there and listen to them? You know who you, who Yeah, let me turn my brain off and just please people. No, no, no. That's not what Elliot does. That's not what he does. Well, he's, he's a weak kid. Yeah, yeah. he's a weak kid. Yeah, yeah. The media of course. I've that for many, many of these kings. It's almost all of them can move. Easily swayed by whatever. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Did they not have any groups at the moment? It's like they just they just It's interesting too, though, in, in, a, in another context, it's another that even the hearts of kings are in the hand of the Lord. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he was able to use even their weaknesses for his glory, his his story to unfold. That he's made known. And he is in this. You know, and the situation is dire. There's not people that you don't have a T-shirt. Hey, you know, after I survived a lion's den. <laughs> people, they didn't have that. People died in lion's dens, and yet God was greater. And so you're right. The king got played, and yet, and he was a weak king in that sense. Um, but we don't have a weak God, do we? Well, greater. Um, he also survived the fall. You know, I mean, he's an older man. Me. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, we heard about someone falling and the pain and all yes. this, you know, so. That's right. I hadn't thought about that. But even the sight, the, the great pit to be thrown in, yeah, we don't read about him having to be drug out, you know, because he's got two broken legs. You know, that's good. Let, let me go here, back over here. Uh, about the, Medo, the Medo-Persian Empire was not a monarchy, total dictatorship. It was more of an oligarch. Well, that's oligarchy. true. So he didn't have total full control, power. Full power. Right. He, I mean, he had ultimate. What he said went. That's right. But he, he had input from other other places, and they did have the Medo-Persian laws. Yes. He had to follow the laws. He did. He could. He could make the law, but this edict. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But he still had a choice to make this edict. Yeah, and you remember in Esther, chapter three, Artaxerxes. I believe that's his name. Artaxerxes made a similar law for Haman right. to have the Jews killed. Yeah. And he couldn't back off of that. He got played too. <laughs> That's right. Come on. Well, you see, um, Daniel had history. You know, it was an officer that just happened. He trusted God. And he knew. When you brought that to them, okay. Yes. It is how we <coughs> No matter what happens, much like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we believe God can deliver us from this fire, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down before the statue. That's right. It's kind of like Paul in the New Testament. For me to live is Christ, but to die is to gain. There's nothing greater than, than Christ. Whether it's life or death, Christ is greater. That's, that's true. It also shows that you can't wait until you you cannot wait. I'm gonna start being faithful whenever I have to be, but not right now. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's not that's not the way God calls us to live. You're right. Y'all know what time it is? We haven't finished. We gotta finish. You got 1025. I got wow, we're getting ready to start Bible studies.
Bartender. I mean, eleven twenty-five. This is up here. My eyes are open. My watch is here. I mean, I meant eleven. Ron, I had something. Somebody said something that triggered this thought in my mind. I was thinking about, you know, earlier I said about Daniel being sinless, and I was thinking maybe he had a regret. You know, Paul had his thorn in the flesh. Right. We don't know where he was. When Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego had to yeah. bow down, where was it? Maybe he had, a, maybe he stayed, maybe he stayed in his room and didn't go out there, so he wouldn't be. Maybe he had a regret that he didn't support his people, yeah. that he didn't stand up at that particular time. We don't know. Don't know. It's a possibility. That's right. It just popped into my head. Something we pops know. in your head. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to ask Jesus one day. I have to be quiet about a lot of things that pop in my head. I'll go ahead and tell you, it's just weird. <laughs> It is. We all, we are going to, I hate to say this, but we really need to. We're going to stop right here, okay? Um, and we'll pick back up at verse, 20, verse 18, and we'll go through the last step the next time, and we'll do also, um, tell you what I'm going to do next time. Before we go into chapter 7 of Daniel, I've encouraged you on the, on the um, study guide to go back and watch the Bible Project uh, video overview of Daniel, because we've been halfway through Daniel that point. And now you can see that in a whole new context, and it really does. It's a great flyover of Daniel to see how things are going to happen, especially as we get into the visions at the end of the second half of Daniel. I will also, if you don't get a chance to watch it, um, I'm also going to show that next time. I think we can do that. I'm going to ask my hero up there, can we show that up here? Um, to where we'll, we'll finish chapter 6, and then we'll watch that overview of the whole thing. And then um, that's, that's where we actually end the next time. Because Daniel 7 needs some time. And, uh, so we'll pick that up after the next scene of Cafe. Which we, we, I just want to make sure we don't just fly through and miss what's there. So I hope that's okay. Um, this, this is a blessing to walk through this with you. With that said, uh, we will pick back up verse 18 um, the next time we're together. Which is next week, Lord willing. So let me pray for us and we'll be, we'll be done. Father, thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Um, thank you that this is not just for our, our heads, uh, for our history lesson. But God, oh my goodness, how you were so good in Daniel's life, so much so. He knew you so well, Lord, um, that you're the one that gets the glory even in the story. Not, and it's not about Daniel, it's about Daniel's God. And he loved you so much and was consistent in his faith, Lord, that even when, when this horror came to him, not by his choice, but he responded by his choice. He responded by continuing to trust in you and to pray. I thank you for that, and I'm challenged by that. Lord, may our lives be intentional in surrendering to you, obeying to you, and that we would be um, unashamed of our faith in Christ and live for you privately and publicly that we would uh, radiate the love of Christ in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you guys. Thank you all for being here today. This is a blessing. Every Wednesday is. And we'll see you, Lord willing, we'll see you next week. And that Bojangles gang, y'all have a good time today. I'm assuming that's on the... Everyone's invited to Bojangles. <laughs>